After the insane success of the PlayStation 2, everyone was lined up to buy the PlayStation 3, touted as the most powerful console of its time and also the most expensive. But looking back at the history of the PlayStation 3, it seems somewhat foggy and something just didn't sit well with PS fans. The PS3 delivered what everyone expected, the next generation of gaming. However, most of the games were either very short or they simply didn't connect with the audience. There was a point when the Xbox started to outsell it and buyers were tilting towards Microsoft's console. Many gaming gems remained hidden during this period. Despite PlayStation releasing good games, people weren't buying them, and the focus shifted more towards the Xbox, causing many good games to slide into the underrated category. In today's video, we're going to unravel some brilliant Ultra PS3 games that are immensely fun to play, but never got their chance to shine. Not because they were bad, but because people just didn't care about them. Before we dive into the details of today's topic, please show us some support by liking and subscribing. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Vanquish, the best 3D Contra game that we never got from Contra franchise. Vanquish is one of the purest, high-intensity, craziest, and most bombastic gameplay experiences I've had since Contra 3, Alien Wars. If there were a Contra game set in 3D space, this is exactly how I would want it to be. In the dynamic landscape of video gaming, where East meets West in a frenetic clash of cultures and gameplay styles, Vanquish emerges as a beacon of harmonious convergence. Developed by Platinum Games, a studio renowned for its unorthodox and thrilling titles like Bayonetta and Mad World, Vanquish is an audacious foray into the third-person shooter genre, traditionally dominated by Western developers. Yet, it refuses to be just another addition to the genre. It redefines it with a distinctly Japanese flair. The game's distinct look, unique gameplay, and cohesive design can all be attributed to the leadership of the esteemed director and producer Shinji Mikami, the creative force behind the original Dino Crisis, Resident Evil, and The Evil Within, among others. At its core, Vanquish is a third-person shooter that marries the frenetic pace of Western action games with the eccentricity and depth of Japanese design. It's a game that moves at breakneck speed, inspired by classic arcade shoot-'em-ups, where the screen often becomes a chaotic ballet of bullets and explosions. This speed is not just for show, it's central to the gameplay. Facilitated by a rocket-powered suit that allows the protagonist, Sam, to dash around the battlefield with a fluidity and grace that's as practical as it is visually stunning. But Vanquish is more than its speed. It's a title that challenges the norms of its genre, offering a gameplay experience that's meant to be digested in short, intense sittings. Critics might scoff at its relatively brief campaign, but this misses the point entirely. Vanquish is designed for replayability, encouraging players to perfect their skills, beat their best times, and climb the leaderboards. It's an arcade experience at heart, one that rewards dedication and mastery over mere completion. Mechanically, the game is a gem. The ARS suit not only accelerates Sam's movements, but also integrates a bullet time feature allowing players to slow down time during critical moments. This mechanic, while not novel, is executed with such finesse and integrated so deeply into the game's fabric that it feels fresh and exhilarating. The game demands and nurtures skill, offering a learning curve that's both challenging and immensely satisfying. Narratively, Vanquish doesn't take itself too seriously. Its plot and characters are over the top, a self-aware nod to both American and Japanese gaming stereotypes. We need that laser out of commission now! I'll pick you up when it's done! That helps. It's a game that knows it's a game, delivering a story that's as much a pastiche of genre cliches as it is an homage to them. The result is a title that's confident in its identity, unafraid to be bold, and unashamedly fun. Conan the Barbarian. 
This is probably the best story-based Conan game ever created, voiced by the legendary Ron Perlman. If there is a game that makes you feel like a true barbarian in the Hyborian world, then this should be your first pick. At its core, Conan is a visceral action adventure that pays homage to the brutal, unforgiving world created by Robert E. Howard. Players assume the role of Conan the Barbarian, a character whose very name conjures images of blood-soaked battlefields and conquered realms. The game's primary allure lies in its combat system, a ballet of destruction, where each swing of Conan's weapon is a potential death sentence for his foes. The game boasts an impressive array of combat styles, from the grace of dual-wielding swords to the raw power of two-handed weapons, each with its own set of brutal finishing moves that are as satisfying to execute as they are devastating. Graphically, Conan is a feast for the eyes, with beautifully rendered landscapes and character models that bring the world of Hyboria to life. The game's artist Eugene Kiem said that he used Frank Frazetta's paintings as a reference for the game's art direction and tried to recreate the sense of scale, color, and lighting that Frazetta used. But I kind of feel I did it in, in the sense that I, I created images that were so powerful that they caught the eye for, for different reasons. He also said that he used a lot of motion capture and facial animation to make the characters more realistic and expressive. The game's visual effects during combat, a spectacle of blood and dismemberment, remain a highlight, emphasizing the game's mature rating. The soundscape of Conan complements its visual prowess, with every clash of steel and grunt of exertion resonating with a satisfying clarity. Ron Perlman's portrayal of Conan, while distinct from Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic interpretation, adds a layer of authenticity to the character, grounding him in the game's fantastical setting. The game's director, Robert Hubner, said that the game was inspired by the God of War series, but also wanted to make it more accessible and less linear. He also said that the game's combat system was influenced by the Soul Calibur series. The controls in Conan are intuitive, allowing players to effortlessly navigate the Barbarian through hordes of enemies and intricate level designs reminiscent of classics like Prince of Persia and God of War. The gameplay and action that drive the experience forward, with the story serving as a backdrop to Conan's relentless pursuit of glory and vengeance. This focus on action over narrative is not a detriment, but rather a conscious choice that aligns with the game's arcade-inspired sensibilities. This is a must-play, even if you are slightly into sword and sorcery genre. This game is a very hard find. You must use emulator to play this. Look, we're gonna sit tight and wait for backup. Understand? Dead to Rights Retribution the original Dead to Rights was one of the craziest action games ever, immersing you in the life of an 80s B-movie protagonist and it was brutally fun. The second game didn't quite hit the mark, but the third installment tried to recapture the charm of the first one. Dead to Rights, Retribution rekindles the flame of its predecessors with a combat system that thrives on brutality and straightforwardness. Jack Slate's arsenal of moves, encompassing everything from bone-crushing melee combos to precise gunplay, offers a visceral satisfaction that few games can match. The addition of Shadow, a fiercely loyal dog with a penchant for savage maulings, introduces a dynamic layer to the gameplay, allowing for moments of brutal synergy between man and beast that are as strategic as they are bloodthirsty. The game's visuals, shrouded in murkiness, contribute to the rough-around-the-edges feel that both adds to and detracts from the overall atmosphere. These graphical shortcomings, coupled with a cliché-ridden narrative that treads familiar ground, might undermine the game's ambitions for some. Yet Dead to Rights, Retribution transcends these imperfections through sheer force of will, or more accurately, through the sheer force of its combat. The game's simplicity in mechanics belies a depth of strategic possibilities, encouraging players to experiment with the full breadth of Jack's and Shadow's capabilities, whether it's leveraging the environment for brutal takedowns or utilizing Shadow's abilities for tactical advantages, there's a constant sense of empowerment that keeps the adrenaline pumping. The narrative has a solid writing and commendable voice acting that breathe life into the seedy world of Grant City. Does a negotiation require a two-way conversation? How many are up there? Do you know? How many hostages? Moments of unintentional humor aside, the story manages to deliver impactful moments that resonate with the themes of corruption and redemption that are central to the Dead to Rights series. 
Exploring the dank alleys and grimy warehouses of Grant City reveals a game environment that, despite its visual limitations, is rich in atmosphere. The attention to detail in world building, from ambient advertisements to the environmental storytelling, paints a vivid picture of a city teetering on the brink of chaos. This backdrop serves as the perfect arena for Jax and Shadow's violent crusade against the criminal underworld. The game's combat system is a mix of hand-to-hand -hand combat and gun shooting, where you can use various weapons and moves to kill human enemies or switch to your dog Shadow for stealth and attack. The game also features a dynamic cover system, a health regeneration system, and an adaptive AI that make the combat more realistic and challenging. The game's combat system is different from the previous games in the series, as it allows you to create your own style of fighting and experience more fluid, responsive, and visceral action. However, by making the game console exclusive, they missed the opportunity to reach a wider audience. Motorstorm Apocalypse. See, this is a biased entry from my side because I am sucker for racing that has some destruction gimmick attached to it. Motorstorm Apocalypse sets itself apart by plunging players into the heart of a fictional American West Coast city besieged by a catastrophic natural disaster. Unlike its predecessors, which explored the untamed terrains of deserts, icy landscapes, and tropical islands, Apocalypse delves into the urban jungle where skyscrapers crumble and the ground beneath your wheels can betray you at any moment. This shift to an urban setting does not merely serve as a backdrop but actively participates in the race, creating a dynamic and unpredictable environment that keeps players on the edge of their seats. The game's festival mode, the centerpiece of the single-player experience, introduces us to three different racers across various difficulty levels, each with their unique perspective and challenges. From the breezy rookie levels with MASH to the intense veteran races with Big Dog, players are treated to a diverse range of vehicles that include, but are not limited to, choppers, big rigs, and the exhilarating additions of supercars and superbikes. The variety in vehicle types ensures a versatile racing experience, compelling players to adapt their strategies according to their chosen ride's strengths and weaknesses. However, Motorstorm Apocalypse is more than just a racing game. It's a spectacle of destruction. The visuals are nothing short of breathtaking, with environmental disasters occurring in real time forcing players to navigate through collapsing buildings, seismic upheavals, and other apocalyptic hazards. This level of environmental interaction is rarely seen in racing games and sets Apocalypse apart as a pioneer in integrating dynamic level design with high-octane racing action. Motorstorm Apocalypse is a triumphant evolution of the series, blending high-speed racing with an unprecedented level of environmental interaction. While it might not cater to the purists seeking a hardcore racing simulator, it offers a unique and exhilarating departure from the norm, making it a must-play for those seeking thrills beyond the traditional racetrack. We'll only piss him off. Rise, Sigrid Warrior. Marlow Briggs and the Mask of Death. Marlow Briggs and the Mask of Death is a hidden gem that deserves a spot in the library of any action-adventure aficionado. It's a game that knows exactly what it wants to be and embraces it with every fiber of its being. In an industry often criticized for taking itself too seriously, Marlow Briggs is a breath of fresh, albeit explosive, air. This game was released very close to GTA 5, and there was no chance of any sales happening around GTA. Let's try to understand what kind of game is this. Marlow Briggs and the Mask of Death catapults players into a whirlwind of revenge and mysticism, casting them as Marlow Briggs, a smoke jumper thrown into a world far removed from the flames he's accustomed to battling. Visiting his girlfriend's archaeological dig site, Damn, it's hot down here. Marlo finds himself embroiled in a sinister plot that transcends the mundane, leading to his untimely demise and subsequent resurrection. Gifted with newfound powers and the sarcastic companionship of the Mayan Mask of Death, Marlo embarks on a vendetta against a megalomaniacal villain intent on divinity through ancient rituals. 
The game's narrative, dripping with cheese and self-aware humor, is a love letter to the era of action heroes who spoke with their fists as eloquently as with their words. Uh, okay. Uh, did you know rainbows are an omen of death? Ah. Uh. Marlowe Briggs doesn't shy away from its B-movie inspirations. Instead, it revels in them, delivering dialogue and scenarios that could easily be at home on a grindhouse film reel. Wonderful news. Excellent work, Miss Torres. But, um, I'm afraid you're going to have to find someone else to help you with the translation. The villain, Long, is the epitome of hammy evil. Dear. <laughs> Count yourself blessed to pay with this. While the dynamic between Marlowe and the mask provides a constant stream of comedic relief amidst the chaos. Yes, either that or dying a thousand horrible deaths, choo-choo. Gameplay-wise, Marlowe Briggs draws comparisons to the God of War series with its hack-and-slash mechanics and emphasis on combo-driven combat. However, it distinguishes itself through its sheer willingness to embrace the absurd. From battles atop runaway trams to confrontations with helicopters, the game ensures that every moment is filled with high-octane action. The inclusion of magic abilities and a variety of weapons adds layers to the combat, though these powers primarily serve to amplify the spectacle rather than the strategy. The true star of the show, however, is the game's set pieces. Marlowe Briggs is a testament to the creativity of its developers, pushing the envelope with sequences that mix combat, platforming, and even shoot 'em up segments. These moments are not just diversions, but integral parts of the experience, seamlessly blending different gameplay styles to keep the adrenaline pumping. Graphically, the game is a mixed bag, with some inconsistencies, but overall delivering a visually compelling experience that complements its cinematic aspirations. The platforming segments and collectible hunts offer a brief respite from the relentless action, providing players with opportunities to explore and fully immerse themselves in the game's world. Marlowe Briggs and the Mask of Death is a hidden gem that deserves a spot in the library of any action-adventure aficionado. It is a game that knows exactly what it wants to be and embraces it with every fiber of its being. In an industry often criticized for taking itself too seriously, Marlowe Briggs is a breath of fresh, albeit explosive, air. Get ready! Genji Days of the Blade. This is one of those games that may have not been appreciated by the mainstream reviewer, but it has developed a cult following. Genji games are a series of action-adventure games developed by Game Republic and published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3 consoles. They are loosely based on the classic Japanese literary work The Tale of the Hike, which narrates the epic conflict between the Genji and Heishi clans during the 12th century. The games feature historical and fictional characters such as the samurai Minamoto no Yoshitsune and the monk Musashibo Benkei, who fight against the Heishi forces using magical stones called Amahagane that grant them supernatural powers. The first game, Genji, Dawn of the Samurai, was released in 2005 for the PlayStation 2. It received generally positive reviews from critics, who praised its graphics, combat system, as the sequel to Genji Dawn of the Samurai, a PlayStation 2 title lauded for its visual prowess and decent action, Days of the Blade continues the saga in feudal Japan, and historical accuracy. Interestingly, this was one of the launch titles for the console and showcased its graphical capabilities. The game introduces a roster of four characters, each bringing their unique skills to the battlefield, which adds a layer of strategic depth to combat. The ability to switch characters seamlessly mid-battle is a well-executed feature that enriches the gameplay, allowing for dynamic tactical adjustments. The narrative of Days of the Blade is packed with stunning visuals and epic boss battles. The reliance on well-tested hack-and-slash mechanics of Onimusha and Shinobi games fully leverage the PS3's capabilities for a more immersive and interactive experience. The inclusion of the Kamui mode an alternate reality where players can dispatch foes unscathed if they master a button-matching minigame serves as a respite from the insanity going on during intense combats. However, there are a few downsides too. 
The game seems to be stuck at 30 FPS, and for a beautiful game with such great combat animation, it really should have been a solid 60 FPS experience. Then there's the issue of the fixed camera, which can become frustrating at times, but this isn't a new problem. There are countless games with fixed cameras, and gamers have learned to navigate through the challenges they present. The game offers a fantastic experience. It's just that when it was released on the PS3, other games completely overshadowed it. Its archaic setting caters to a niche audience, which also dampened the sales. This was the last of the Genji games on any platform, and finding a physical copy of this game is really hard. The easiest way to experience it is with an emulator, where you can actually play it at 60 FPS, which is how it's meant to be played. Mercenaries 2 World in Flames this game had immense potential, truly insane potential. When the trailers were released, people went absolutely wild over it, and it had the potential to rival or even surpass series like Just Cause. However, when the game launched on PC, PS3, and Xbox, it was riddled with innumerable bugs and glitches that completely diminished the game's appeal. Improvements were made later on, but by then, it was too late. Let's delve into Mercenaries 2 and why you should consider playing it now. The Mercenaries game series are a set of action-adventure games that revolve around the exploits of a group of mercenaries in various war-torn regions. The games are known for their open-world gameplay, destructible environments, and dark humor. Ah! The series consists of two main titles and one cancelled spin-off. Destruction 2005 was the first game in the series released for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox. It was set in North Korea during a fictional military coup where the player had to hunt down the members of the rogue regime. The game received generally positive reviews from critics who praised its freedom, variety, and replay value. Mercenaries 2 World in Flames 2008 was the sequel, released for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and Microsoft Windows. It was set in Venezuela during a fictional oil crisis where the player had to take down a corrupt dictator who betrayed them. Mercenaries 2 World in Flames is a game that unabashedly celebrates the art of destruction. If your idea of a good time includes leveling buildings, incinerating jungles, and obliterating tanks with tactical nukes, then Mercs 2 might just be the anarchic playground you've been seeking. At its core, Mercenaries 2 offers a straightforward narrative reminiscent of a Schwarzenegger action flick chock full of one-liners and a plot focused more on spectacle than depth. You checking out my ass? Character selection from among three mercenaries, each with minor differences, barely affects the gameplay experience, emphasizing that the real star of the show is the destruction you can wreak. Whether you're piloting tanks or calling in airstrikes, the game gives you a vast arsenal to create havoc. The inclusion of air support offers some of the most gratifying moments in the game, allowing for stunning displays of destruction that few titles can match. Playing today, especially on the PC, would be a blast when you can crank up the graphics to full and set the imaginary world of mercenaries on fire. Singularity. This was an incredibly smart and entertaining game, blending a myriad of pop culture elements so seamlessly that once you're drawn into its world, it's hard to put the controller down. The PS3 era was a time when first-person shooters gained significant popularity on consoles, a period that saw the controller evolve into a more viable tool for these types of games, which had previously been a bit cumbersome to navigate with the controllers of that generation. Perhaps this transition period affected the game's reputation slightly. Let's dive deeper and see why this game is worth playing now. Singularity is a first-person shooter game that was released in 2010 for the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and Microsoft Windows. It was developed by Raven Software and published by Activision. The game is based on the concept of time manipulation and features a device called the Time Manipulation Device, TMD, that can alter the age and properties of objects and living beings. The game's story revolves around a mysterious island called Katorga 12, where Soviet experiments involving a powerful element called E-99 took place during the Cold War era. 
The player controls Nathaniel Renko, a U.S. soldier who investigates the island and discovers that the timeline has been altered by a catastrophic event called The Singularity. The game was inspired by other media that explored the themes of time travel, alternate history, and science fiction, such as the movies The Terminator, The Butterfly Effect, and The Island of Dr. Moreau, and the books The Time Machine, The Philadelphia Experiment, and The Andromeda Strain. The heart of Singularity's gameplay is the Time Manipulation Device, TMD, a tool that allows Renko to alter the age of objects and enemies. The TMD introduces unique elements to battles, allowing players to age enemies to dust, revert them into monsters, or create zones of slowed time. These mechanics, combined with a robust arsenal and the ability to steer bullets, infuse the gunplay with moments of creativity and visceral satisfaction. Singularity shines brightest in its departure from linear corridors into more dynamic set pieces, such as a decaying boat that reverts to its former glory or battles against towering beasts. These moments, while thrilling, highlight the game's inconsistent pacing and reliance on conventional level design, leaving players longing for more instances of genuine innovation. The game offers three endings, accessible by revisiting the final moments that added a replayability value. Go back to this game now just for the TMD mechanic, and enjoy it because it's one of its kind and none of the other games have truly mastered it like the way Singularity did. Shadow of the Damned Shadow of the Damned is a third-person action horror game that was released in 2011 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. It was developed by Grasshopper Manufacture, a Japanese studio led by Goichi Suda, also known as Suda51. The game was a collaboration between Suda51 and Shinji Mikami, the creator of the Resident Evil series, who served as the executive producer and creative director. The game also featured music by Akira Yamaoka, the composer of the Silent Hill series. The game's development began in 2006, when Suda51 and Mikami met at a party and decided to work together on a project. The game was initially titled Kurayami, which means darkness in Japanese, and was inspired by the works of Franz Kafka. The game was supposed to be a psychological horror game that used the Wii remote as a flashlight and a weapon. However, the game was canceled by EA, the publisher, due to creative differences and technical issues. The game was then reworked and renamed as Shadows of the Damned with a more action-oriented and humorous approach. The game's story follows Garcia Hotspur, a demon hunter who travels to the underworld to rescue his girlfriend Paula from the Lord of Demons, Fleming. Garcia is accompanied by Johnson, a former demon who can transform into various weapons and a motorcycle. The game's tone is influenced by the grindhouse and splatter genres with a lot of gore, violence, and sexual innuendo. Shadow of the Damned follows the story for Garcia Hotspur, a demon hunter who goes to the underworld to save his girlfriend Paula from Fleming, the Lord of Demons. Along the way, he faces various enemies and challenges and witnesses Paula's repeated deaths and torture. The game's development was challenging as the team had to deal with cultural and language barriers, as well as the limitations of the Unreal Engine 3, which was used to create the game. The game also faced some censorship issues, as some of the content was deemed too offensive or graphic for certain regions. The game received mixed reviews from critics and players who praised the game's style, music, and humor. Darkness. How did you not know? Some demon hunter, I say. <sighs> but criticized the game's gameplay, graphics, and length. The game sold poorly and did not meet the expectations of EA or the developers. Despite the game's commercial failure, it has gained a cult following among fans of Suda51 and Mikami who appreciate the game's originality, creativity, and personality. The game is considered by some to be a hidden gem and a underrated classic in the horror genre. The game has also inspired some fan art, cosplay, and merchandise. The game's soundtrack, composed by Yamaoka, was released as a CD and a vinyl, and was praised for its quality and variety. The game's voice actors, including Steve Blum, Greg Ellis, and Tara Strong, also received positive feedback for their performances.
Resonance of Fate. Resonance of Fate is a role-playing game that was developed by Tri-Ace, a Japanese studio known for the Star Ocean and Valkyrie Profile series. The game was released in 2010 for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, and was later remastered in 2018 for the PlayStation 4 and PC. The game features a unique combat system that revolves around guns and acrobatic moves, as well as a steampunk-inspired world that is divided into hexagonal grids. The game's development began in 2007, when Tri-Ace wanted to create a new IP that would appeal to both Japanese and Western audiences. The game's director, Takayuki Suguro, was inspired by the works of Hayao Miyazaki, especially his film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. He wanted to create a game that would explore the themes of environmentalism, human nature, and fate. He also wanted to create a game that would challenge the conventions of the RPG genre and offer a fresh and innovative experience. The game's combat system was designed by Suguro and his team, who wanted to create a system that would combine strategy, action, and spectacle. The game's combat system is based on three concepts, scratch damage, direct damage, and hero actions. Scratch damage is inflicted by machine guns and it reduces the enemy's health bar, but it can be recovered over time. Direct damage is inflicted by handguns and grenades and it permanently reduces the enemy's health bar, but it is less effective than scratch damage. Hero actions are special moves that allow the characters to run, jump, and shoot across the battlefield while avoiding enemy attacks and creating combo opportunities. The game's combat system requires the player to balance these three elements and use them effectively to defeat the enemies. The game's world was created by the art director Kaoru Kaku and his team who wanted to create a world that would reflect the game's themes and atmosphere. The game's world is set in a post-apocalyptic future where humanity lives in a massive tower called Basel, which was built to purify the polluted air. The game's world is divided into hexagonal grids, which represent different areas and environments. The game's world is also influenced by the steampunk genre, which combines elements of science fiction and Victorian aesthetics. The game's world features various machines, gears, pipes, and steam engines, as well as different cultures, costumes, and architectures. The game's music was composed by Matoi Sakuraba, who is also the composer of The Star Ocean and Valkyrie Profile series. The game's music is mainly orchestral, and it matches the game's mood and tone. The game's music also features some rock and electronic elements, as well as some vocal tracks. The game's main theme song, Eminence Grease, is performed by the singer Phylon, and it expresses the game's theme of fate. The game's development was challenging as the team had to deal with the limitations of the hardware as well as the expectations of the fans and the critics. The game also faced some localization issues as some of the content and dialogue had to be changed or removed for the Western release. The game received mixed reviews from critics and players who praised the game's combat system, world, and music, but criticized the game's story, characters, and difficulty. The game sold poorly and did not meet the sales target of the publisher, Sega. Despite the game's commercial failure, it has gained a cult following among fans of Tri-Ace and RPGs, who appreciate the game's originality, creativity, and challenge. The game is considered by some to be a hidden gem and an underrated masterpiece in the RPG genre. The game has also inspired some fan art, cosplay, and merchandise. The game's remaster, Resonance of Fate 4K HD Edition, was released in 2018 and it features improved graphics, performance, and resolution. The game's remaster was well received by fans and newcomers who enjoyed the game's enhanced presentation and gameplay. Today's video is finished, guys. If you had fun watching what we did in this video, please show us some love by liking and subscribing. Till next time. Maybe trouble at the power station. You up for a trip? Yeah, I am. I'm good in the dark. <laughs>